I just remember the full time whistle going, I'm, I was just like relieved. I was just like, wow, we've done it. I had bloody 80 people in the stands for me. And I'm yeah. like, they're not going home disappointed here tonight. <laughs> but like this needs to be a celebration for everyone. What's your first memory of football, watching, playing? I remember the World Cup in Italy in 1990. And I remember watching it on a little TV we had in mum and dad's room. And I was just like, this is incredible. Yeah. Like, I just fell in love with the game and wanted to play it at every opportunity I, I got. So then you go into the playoffs. I knew what was at stake. I knew what it meant, what it would have meant to everybody. That was the sort of overriding emotion was, wow, this is going to be life changing. This is where I wanted to try and end up is in the Premier League and I did it with Crystal Palace. The soccer is, what's a World Cup like? The World Cups were dreams come true. When I read about you, it's like this man doesn't miss penalties. So that's why they keep putting you up. And what is it like scoring in a World Cup? Oh, it's amazing. Is it? 2015 Asian Cup. What's your memories of being the first Australian captain to hold up a major trophy in football? The end of full-time huddle and the boss is speaking. What's he saying? He's going, it's only going to make this story even better. We're, we're good here. We're fine. The whole stadium was nervous. Football's was incredible. It's been incredible to me and, and my family and it can take you to places and experience mm. things and hopefully there's a lot more of that to come. Well, what about this? A man that has captained the Socceroos, he's been to World Cups, he's lifted the Asian Cup, he's now pretty much running Tottenham. Don't worry about Ange, he's been on the show, he'd understand that. His name is Mule Yednak. Mule, welcome to the How Are You Games, mate. It's great to see you. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You are here for how long in Australia? Not long at all. Not yeah, long. It's a it's a brief trip, but very worthwhile. Uh, have you got a jet lag? I spend a lot of time, unfortunately, travelling, um, which is good and bad. Have you got a jet lag hack? Do you do anything? What do you do? I haven't had to. Exp- I haven't experienced it in a little while, to be honest with you. But um, during my time playing, which mm-hmm. is not so long ago, I keep busy. Try and keep busy, and yeah, take the sleep when you can, and uh, try and crack crack on and plough through. We are going to talk to you about your long and illustrious career, which I'm looking forward to. But Tottenham are coming to Melbourne, the global capital of sport. Uh, Global Football Week. Tell us about the event, what's going to happen. You've got some incredible players at Tottenham. Um, Melbourne will embrace this. I've got no doubt the MCG will be packed like it normally is for any of these type of events. Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, it's incredible. I think even just doing the announcement yesterday, how everyone's going to get behind it. Obviously, MCG, so iconic. Um, Hopefully a full house, but I think more importantly, just to be able to bring the team over, get them experiencing it in front of the fans. Incredible stuff. The team itself, like if you you look at the the job you're in, you know, you've got your Australians there, but you've got Brazilian, you've got Argentinian, you've got Europeans, you've got a South Korean. Like, how do you, and you've lived this, how how do you mould a group of internationals that come together and the one language they speak is football together, but the rest is different cultures, languages? It always fascinates me, Milo. Football family, I think, is the best way to sum it up. Um, That's the way we try and embrace it. We try and you know, connect. Um, It is our language, I guess, but, and and that's the way we do connect. Like you said, different cultures. It's not easy. It's not straightforward, but very fortunate to be in the environment, in the industry, Um, obviously working under Ange, who you know well, Mm. um, and and being part of that, immersing myself in that. And I think seeing it come and and being on the journey with them this season on how it's been from where we started to where we are up until this point has been... uh, yeah, something special. What do you think the the, the boys will think of uh, the MCG? Like, I don't know if you remember Carlson. I don't know if he's played at Maracanã, which I remember going to as a uh, travelling around like one hundred and sixty thousand. But what what do you think they'll think of the MCG? Oh, they'll love it. Will they? Yeah, hundred thousand. There's not there's not one in the UK. A hundred thousand. No. So I think once they get in and they see the the size, the sheer size of it, and then they get in on the match day and and feel the atmosphere. It'll get them right up for it, and that's going to be again. It's it's a special moment to be able to go and do it on a, it's such an iconic venue. They'll they'll be aware of it, and if, they, if they're not, we'll we'll tell them. The gaffer is a low key man. I love the term gaffer. It'd be nice for him to come back here, um, where he grew up. You know, he sat on this show, and if you haven't listened to this episode, you must. And he coached his um, primary school under ten side to a state championship, and now he's bringing Tottenham out here. It's, um, I can't wait to see how he is received. Oh, I think we're all waiting for that, how he's received and the 
the sort of what it's going to be like. But yeah, it's incredible. I think I'm 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 as happy as anyone to to be able to have him experience that again, knowing sort of the journey and the way it's been. But uh, can't wait. I said, like I said, I'm I'm excited for him. <laughs> Um, check out the show notes. You can see all the details, where to get tickets. Uh, it's going to be an unbelievable event, the Global Football Week. Before we get to you and your journey, at, so at this stage of the year, Milo, I work on AFL football, which is a highly analysed game, and I understand what the what we call assistant coaches do. So explain to me, I'm fascinated. I could ask you two hours of questions about this because I'm fascinated by the English Premier League. What, what's your role? And then we'll get into the specifics of what you do at training and game day, but, but what's your actually official role? And what does that entail at yeah, Tottenham? Yeah, I guess with us, we're out, so I'll probably give you a little bit out around the structure of it. So we, obviously, Angie's the manager, the head coach, the equivalent. What do they uh, call him? What do the players call him? Boss. Boss, right. Boss. boss Gaffer. Boss. Gaffer's well, well, obviously... And what are you, the, the next boss? Like, where, where, no, where, no, where, no, right, no, right, no. Right, no, down no, the chain? No, no, no. <laughs> right. So we've got then, and then we've got, uh, we've got Chris Davies, who's our, he's sort of like the head assistant. And then underneath that, or alongside that, however you want to pitch it, yep. we sort of um, we've got there's three three other coaches and then the goalkeeper coach as well. So okay. we're we're a team of six um, on the coaching. The ones that are out on the pitch and and so uh, do you do you coach a specific part of the game plan of the field? Like I, know, I think you're involved yeah, in set plays. Yeah, yeah, I am involved in the set plays. So the defensive element of the set plays, I take take sort of that's something that I lead on. So the uh, defensive element of the set plays. So yeah. so how you defend against the opposition set plays. Yeah. Okay, so how how does this work? Is it video analysis if you're yeah. playing Chelsea next week, do you look at do you like, how's it work? So obviously you come up with your structure on what you want to do. You you work on a principles base and and you know something that we want to do is be aggressive. You know, it probably goes with everything else that we do. We yes. try and be aggressive in our starting position, the way we attack the ball, how we how we want to try and counter counter attack the opposition and, and score from their set plays essentially. Um, hmm. So you have that, and then you obviously do your analysis as you do. I work alongside an an, an analyst that that sort of we go through that quite regularly. On is, is that video based? Video based. We do that. We you know we have clips of previous games, what they like to do, any key threats. We look at that as a as a sort of coaching department, me and him, and then I'll then present to the players. Um, usually match day minus one, match day minus two. And what does that presentation look like? Mila? So that presentation will basically, we'll give them a, a bit of a flavor on what the opposition tend to do, what the delivery is like, whether they tend to do an in-swinger, whether they tend to do an out-swinger, huh. do they have a short variation, um, and which area of the sort of penalty box do they like to hit? Is it more front post? Is it the middle of the goal? Is it the back post? And so you do, there's, there's quite a sort of detailed sort of bit to it. We give the players, we try and, sim, again, simplify it as much as you can. The, the messaging is very clear to the players. This and, is, and with that messaging, sorry to interrupt, I said I got, I got a million questions go for on. you on this. So say you're playing Chelsea and they've got, you know, a, a striker that's going to be, or someone's going to be putting the ball into the box. Do you then say to your three defenders, right, if they're outside the box and they're coming in here, we want, you on this fella, you on this fella, you on this fella, or is it a defensive structure that just sort of copes with the the moving situation? Yeah, I was, I, I was getting to that. Well, so, I should have shut so, up. Then. Uh, Sorry, Mila. I get I too love, excited. I love the eagerness. I love it. But um, yeah. So then, on the back of the video, we'll then usually on the match day minus one, we'll then run through through that through our structure. It'll be depending on who's going to be playing from our from our point of view, yep. what position they'll be within that structure, uh -huh. and then any any key messages around that. It's like you said, if it's, for example, someone that played, like our structure and, and someone that's going to be, we call them blockers or guys that sort of are in our second line, if it's a key threat, we'll give them probably that, that bit of information then to say, listen, these are the guys that you probably have to look at again. And then that'll be that. If it's if there's a short variation, right, your position's here for now. If they play short, you might have to come away from your position and then go and press the ball aggressively or stop them from trying to access a certain area. And that's how you do it. So you run through that, obviously, live, and you play through it. And on the training? On the training pitch, it needs to be against opposition. So we'll we'll set up two 11s, basically, how the opposition, their stru a general sort of structure for them, what they tend to do hopefully get the delivery right so that the boys can feel that in the moment. 
Um, and then that, and then we practice that and we run through that just like we would like just like they'd experience on a match day. Obviously, without we've got a little bit more time to set it up. Um, hmm. And then so we do that, which again it happens. You know the lads feel that. So then we'll film that, and then I'll I'll look at. That. Oh, you film training. We'll film that. We'll film the set. We'll film that. We'll have a look at that back. Then we'll analyze any little bits of detail that maybe we need to give to the lads then on a match day, um, individuals, specific areas of the goal um, that we want to defend. And if, if there's any relevant information, we'll pass that on to the lads. If not, we just we give them a little final rundown on, on match day about their roles and responsibilities, and then that's it. And on the training track, you're obviously still a really fit fella. Do, do, you, do you sit back or do you have the boots on? Are you, are you out there involved? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. You're, you're out there. Um... So you've still got it? Well, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that I wouldn't go that far, but okay. um, you know, if if needed, I sort of participate and, and get involved. But again, you're out there if you're putting stuff on, like it, you're on your feet all the time. You're you're in and amongst it. You, you whether you're serving into the to the practice or giving a little bit of information. Yeah, you're you're in you're in the thick of it, and that's the way um, Ange has designed it for us. Like the the, the coaches are. The assistants are, are leading on a lot of elements to training, and you, you know you've played with some of the best footballers in the world. You've, as I said, you won an Asian Cup and played in multiple World Cups. Do, do you get on the like the EPL is like it's the big show, isn't it? Do you, do you get on the field and look at what some of these guys are doing at training when it's happening around you and everything? Holy heck, there's some talented <laughs> operators here. Yeah, I think you you know you. It's, it's, I just, like I said, you, you sit back and you go, wow, but you, you see how hard the boys work every single day. So it's not a coincidence when they're, you know, being able to produce the sort of performances that they have been. Um, cause again, we push them and you know, they're all too eager to, to make sure that they're doing the work and so, seeing so how, the value of doing that how, more importantly. How, how, you know, well, firstly you, how many hours were, if you're playing a, a, a Saturday tie and a next Saturday tie, and there's nothing during the week. There's no cups or uh, Europe. How many hours are you at the club a week? Depending on the, I guess, depending on the sort of schedule, like you mentioned there. But most days, typical day for me, I try and do my sort of exercise before. Yep. Before the boys get come in, so I'm I'm there at seven o'clock, six, seven o'clock, depending, and then. Leaving at again probably like five six. Okay, so they're, they're long days, and the boys. What's the intensity? Again, I come back. Excuse my ignorance. I come back from an AFL perspective, and people listening to this will have an idea what the AFL boys and the rugby league guys do. Like, what's the intensity of training? How, how many sort of K's are the 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 Tottenham players doing a week? How many sessions are they doing? That type of thing. Yeah, I think uh, again the way it's sort of periodized, the way we structure it. Um, each day we'll have a different stimulus. Um, I'm sure it's pretty similar to yes. to those sports that you mentioned. And every day we'll try and hit a certain amount. Again, we look at always it's it's the intent and the and the sort of tempo we train at to try and condition the lads again. And then if we need to, we reduce the time just so we can keep them fresh for the for the game at the weekend. It it depends. Again, it it depends, but oh, they are they're reaching some incredible numbers, the boys. Are and they? Uh, probably if not the, the highest working team in the, in the league. And tell me about the facilities. Like whenever you see, like you're smiling straight away, is it next level stuff? Yeah, it's incredible. Um, you know, it's... So, so it's, what's the training setup? How many pitches are there? Is there indoor parts, outdoor parts? Yeah, there's a there's a whole, there's there's, there's work going on all the time, but the, 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 the training facility is state of the art. It's probably arguably the, the best one in the country. Um, so what what's the thing that you walk in and think... Oh, geez, I wouldn't have minded that when I was playing. Oh, that's probably the whole component of right. it, to be honest. But again, the way it's sort of looked after and kept. But I think from from our perspective, though, and again, I guess part of that is sort of where I came from and that, like, I see it and I'm like, yeah, like, it's it's phenomenal. And I, you know, you'd pinch yourself at certain moments, but you're like, you know, it's, you got to, you go, then it's just another pitch. Like, you just, yep. like, the work's still there and you got the work doesn't change. And, and, the, you sort of you go through that process and you're like, this is great, but like we've still got to keep pushing still got to get forward. Done. You know, we're not. We're, this is this is this looks lovely aesthetically and it, and it has everything for everyone to be at the top level. But we've got to just keep pushing to try and get there. Is there a chef? Yeah, the club's got a yeah. There is. There's oh, everything's catered for pretty much. So when the players get there, you know, 
lettuce leaves from protein bars. Do you sneak into that or you have to bring your own gear? Oh, no, we, 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 we get looked after. The club's uh, very okay. generous in that sense, absolutely. A- and game day itself. Again, in, in this part of the world, we see a coaching box removed, typically up in the stands. Some coaches coach down. Obviously, the, the gaffer is always on the ground. Is there, like, what, what are you doing when the match is being played? So I'm one of I'm because of the numbers of our coaching department, we've got, we don't have a room. I end up sitting up top, like you mentioned there. Yep. I've sit up with the analysts um, and observe, particularly the first half, I'll observe anything. Uh, and then any messages that need to be fed back down. They get during game. So how's it get fed during game? The earpiece. There's right. a, there's one of the other coaches that me and him are connected. The analysts are connected there on the computers, obviously doing doing their thing. And then that can be passed to Ange. Half time. Half time. Yeah. Half time. So half, you're not trying to get stuff to them. Half time. Half time's the the way we sort of message. Again, um, the boss will deliver his messages at half time. Any relevant uh, bits of information, any relevant clips that he needs to show, and then. There's a period there at the end where if there are any other individuals you need to tackle or try and get some information to, we'll, we'll try and give that as, as quick as we possibly can. And how critical, as in from a criticism, well, not criticism, a learning perspective, um, after, say, you've got rolled, which has been a rarity, like Tottenham's had an unbelievable season, although as we're recording this, you've come off a, a loss on the weekend. How much time is then spent sitting with the players in a video position saying, all right, they scored here because we did this, this, and this, and we need to do this. Yeah, I think um, sort of the way it works. We'll obviously, as a staff, we'll watch. We we'll tend to watch the game back, analyze, do whatever we need to do from that perspective. We'll discuss that. Then, usually, and it won't happen until we get again after the lads return from international break. We'll sit down and we'll do a debrief of the game, um, to which by Ange will give the messages. That he feels are necessary for the for the players, and then that'll be from a team perspective. That'll be that that'll be it. Like that'll be the message of yep. the meeting, and then we we're there to prepare for the next game. Um, and so the players get that information from the boss, and then if there are any other individuals or units or like you said, the lines of defense, attack, or midfielders, if they need any other bits around the game. Um, They'll, they'll get that as well. And the game itself, the way English Premier League football is being played in 2023-24, uh, the like, football's been going for you know a couple of hundred years. It is the game that you were playing for Crystal Palace 10 years ago much different to what uh, Tottenham, Liverpool, Chelsea, Manchester United are playing in 23-24? And if so, what are the differences? Yeah, I, I, it's it's a hard one to judge. I, I'd say it had it would have had to have changed. Um, it's evolved in terms of probably the athleticism. Not to say that you know I wasn't athletic or the sort of the pace and that wasn't there at, when I was there. But well, most sports have got quicker, haven't they? With one, the athletes, one hundred percent, right? So it's no different in our sport. Um, probably from the sheer numbers you're seeing and, you know, the intensity that people are working at, the, the, the amount of high-speed efforts that people are able to do, the way, that, the way that they're sort of pushing themselves. And then the flip side of that is everyone's, again, the, the way that teams are playing are more, you know, obviously with the influence of manager, different managers coming to the, to the leagues and the styles they want to try and implement. I guess from that perspective, it might have changed as well. So, um, but... As a football, someone that's immersed himself in football for his whole life, you just love to see it. Like, again, you you can't help but go. Oh, this would be great to be around, but I'm doing the, you know, I'm doing the, I'm there every day, and I yep. can see exactly what the boys are going through and how they're sort of learning and what they're putting themselves through, you know, from a physical, technical, tactical. A psychological perspective every single day and, and how that sort of what that does with the environment that we're trying to create and how that's sort of going to try and push us going forward. And a, a home game, it's White Hat Lane, yeah? Well, yeah, it's the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Right, but okay. it was White Hart Lane. Okay, You're the, right. It the, is on White Hart Lane. 
So what is the atmosphere at a home game for Tottenham? How many people are in there and what's it like? I th- it's ju- it's over 60,000 wow. every single game. It's so very just, difficult to get a ticket as well. It's um, just pumping? Yeah. it's For me, it's been incredible. Um, it's, 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 and that's a credit to everybody that's, that's, I guess, associated with the football club. But again, I'll, I'll bring it back to the lads giving, giving them something to cheer about. Yes. Uh, and the coach getting into, or the, sorry, the gaffer, the boss getting to play in a way that people want to see. Yeah. And that's, you know, why well, that's part of the, that's part of that. That's part of trying to create something special. Um, by something that they're going to be able to resonate with that represents them as as people, as fans, as supporters, you know, and and we've we've started that process. I think would be my best way of describing it. And the lads have given them some really good things. We've showcased some really good moments um, of the season. But again, we we, we keep pushing forward. Yeah. So, uh, so try and enunciate this best you can. So Ange is a bloke from Melbourne. Obviously, he's he's, he's been your manager um, for the for um, the Socceroos, and he's had a go in the A League where he couldn't get a start, as he explained to us. And he went to Japan, he went to Celtic. Now, now he's in the EPL. What is it about him as a football manager that has enabled him to have this journey? And people keep thinking he's he's ready for the next level. This bloke, he's like if I said to you ten years ago, you know, he's giving me coaching in the EPL. In his words, it'd be a thousand to one. Yeah, but that's right from where he was then. Yep. Um, so what is it about? But him? I think, again, and it is, it's about opportunities. It's about taking those moments. But again, the determination and and the sheer understanding of what he wants to do um, and, and understanding how he wants his teams to play. And I guess being through that process for many, many years, um, and how unwavering it is, it, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's great to see. It's great to be around. It's great to be part of and learn from that. And it's, like I said, then there's no coincidence to this now, what we're experiencing from my perspective. Anyway, that's just my opinion, but, um, and, and how does he formulate a relation? Like what's his relationship like with the players? I, I think he's, he might've said on the show before that he likes to, in a way, almost, like they seem to love him, but he said he needs to keep a bit of a distance. But he he's dealing with, you know, the the cream of world footballs. How, how does he interact on a day to day basis with these guys? I think the interactions are just what it, exactly how probably he explained them, and and you know, true to him, true to what I've experienced, I guess as a player. I, I don't think we, you know, my experience as a player was um, when I had him for the for the Socceroos was. You never could not go and have a chat to him. So the you door know, was the open. The door was always open. Um, you know, he always he gave you the freedom to make your own choices, and you know, and always had the. It's always a. There's always a team focus there, which I think is always important when you're in team sport. Is you know, you're putting the team first. Sometimes you know you you can't think about yourself in those moments. You've got to think about the team. If it's right for the team, then okay, it might be a good decision. So. I definitely, I definitely, you know, that's something that I person that that's something that I love anyway. That, that that's something that I really, really keen on. And again, how it happens on a day to day, there's probably small interactions, but the team gets addressed consistently at certain moments throughout the week. Mm-hmm. And in those moments, their attention is through the roof. And in that. In that, in a game environment, is coaches seem to become more and more uh, calm, and there's less of the you know any given Sunday or blokes with veins popping out when they're addressing the team. Is there still a time in modern football for the coach to go in there at the uh, halftime break and give them a genuine what you and I would refer to as old fashioned cook, or that doesn't happen? I think it's dependent on those moments and what, obviously, when you're working, when you're working in the environments, like high performance um, environments, sometimes if that's what's necessary, then that's what has to be said. Okay. I think that's you know yep. fair to say where you know we are, we we're working in you know people 
if that if that's what deem they deem necessary at that moment what's going to spark a reaction which is ultimately what you're trying to get right mm -hmm. to help support um then that then sometimes that needs to be addressed and is this well, i'm about to start talking about your football career now but is this do you look at this now and think yep coaching i know you you're getting your license and stuff like this, but is this something you'd really like to pursue? Can can you look at the, the top job? I don't necessarily mean at Tottenham, but eventually at Tottenham or Bayern or Rail or wherever you end up, can you look at and think, yep, this is, I'm building my skills, this is what I'd like to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's no, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that that's what it'll be, but um, I think part of that is enjoying the process of trying to get to that point. Yep. And I'm in the, I'm in the, best environment I can be. Well, unbelievable environment. Person, do you know what I mean? And I'm learning from somebody that I've got a lot of respect and admiration for and someone that, uh, you know, has helped me along that journey, which, you know, is very, for me is, is, uh, you know, something that again, I continue to keep pushing myself in order to try and get to that point. Just before we get to you and football, you, you got a, you got a half a football team at home, you and your wife here. Yeah? How, how many kids you got? <laughs> four. Four boys, girls? Yeah, I got four boys. <laughs> No wonder he's happy to come to Australia for a short stint. Come on, mate. You told me it was the world's toughest trip and it was a short turnaround. And your wife's at home with the power. What's the range of the boys? I've got a 12. So my eldest is 12. Um, and then I've got a 10-year-old and then a 6-year-old and a 4-year-old. And what... I spoke about this with Anne. You know, his kids had lived all around the world. What, like, what an experience this can be for you and your family. I, obviously... You know, kids want certain routine, but but uh, like unbelievable opportunity for a young family. Yeah, how, how do you how do you juggle I it think, all? You know, from my own perspective, my own sort of personal experience. Uh, me and my wife moved. We had a we moved over from Australia to Turkey first, then we moved to the UK. Yeah. And then the, all the kids were born in London. Okay, so that's all they know. So that's all they know. Huh. They've obviously experienced it back here and they've travelled. Do they have English accents? Uh, the, no. Okay, good. I'd say that's okay. every now and then they pick up a little bit of a... Did you knock that on the head school? straight away? Well, me, me or the missus. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, in all honesty, yeah, so that's what they know and, and obviously that's, that's, that's my experience of it. Again, that's the way it is. And, but football's... Football's incredible. It's been incredible to me and and my family. And and again, it's it can take you to places and mm. experience things. And and hopefully, there's a lot more of that to come. I think that's what I love about the game is it's truly international. I'm privileged to work on AFL and cricket, and the AFL is great. But then in cricket, you're all of a sudden you're in India or the West Indies or like these amazing yeah. experiences that come your way. So, talking about. Um, different countries tell me the the heritage of your name and where your family originated from and how they ended up here in australia and how far back that was so my parents are my parents are both croatian okay. they're both born in croatia uh, my parents my dad was i think he was in his early teenager years when he came over my grandparents migrated over to australia so he came with his parents yeah he came with his parents so they were the first ones to come over um, so when would that have been the uh, Probably the seventies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it was the early seventies. Yep. And my mum and her family were. My mum was younger. She's she got a couple of older siblings, but she she was a little bit younger. But again, a very similar time. Really, they all came over, and again, both sets of grandparents were the first generation to come to to Australia and set up and and work and create a incredible future for the future generations, yeah. you know, education and the, you know, sort of the, the working lifestyle. And do you know what they, like, again, I had this conversation with Ange about like, it's hard to imagine, especially then leaving a country to a whole nother country, the other side of the, they would have known stuff all about Australia. Like, do you know what they did for work at the start to set up? Oh yeah. My, my grandfather on my dad's side, um, he was working on a he, he, he used to work in Germany working in a factory and he had, he was like a supervisor, like 200 men. Huh. Um, so again, when they came over here, I think they got into that sort of carpentry building sort of stuff. Um, I know my grandfathers, both of them, my, when my dad sort of, my dad was a carpenter or he's a carpenter by trade and building company and the rest of it. But like they had all worked together at some point, um, throughout and 
like you mentioned, it's it's a tremendous. Um, yeah, it's one of those. It's a leap of faith, it's a, isn't it's a, it? It's a it's a leap of faith. I think I think from my own perspective, uh, you know, I think I lost my grandfather a few years ago now, a number of years ago, and it wasn't until that point where the way I sort of spoke about that was um, just how much that step was, and I sort of explained that to try to explain it to my dad and my uncle at the time, and I was like, it, it was incredible, like what we've what we've been able to do on the back of those decisions back then um and which you know you you look at and you're like wow like that was only because myself like having sort of doing something similar now with mm. being abroad you're like i i get it like maybe not a lot of other people that are in oz now understand it mm. and uh you know my family and stuff but when you sort of spoke about it in that text then they, they, they were like Oh yeah, that that's that that you are right, and I'm like, yeah, well, this is, and now I, I can see very a lot of similarities in the way sort of me being away from everyone here and and what that's like as well. I'm sorry to hear about your your grandfather's no longer with you. Um, wh what do you think? Did you ever have conversations with him or your grandparents? So they've moved from Croatia, and then their grandson becomes the captain of the national football side in Australia, like they must have sat back and think, Oh wow. Like the opportunities we've provided. Yeah. And I think, extremely proud. I think, I think I was very fortunate enough to have my grandparents in my life for a very, very long time. Very, very lucky. Um, still got two of them to Good. this day, which again, I'm really looking forward to seeing them um, in the next few days, but they were, they were there from the start of my football journey, you know, that grandfather I mentioned, he bought it. He had a, I think when I first started playing early nineties, he had a big camcorder. He had the big one that used to sit <laughs> on the shoulders and he used to come and film me. And we used to watch those tapes back and you could hear him and my grandmother arguing in the background and, you know, in some of those old tapes and it, it, it you can't help, but it put a smile on your face. So again, they were there f throughout that journey throughout and they were the, I guess they were the proudest people that I knew, you know, well, it was, it was incredible. Uh, well, you've gone on to, you know, captain your country at a couple of world cups would be extraordinary thing for them. So where's it start? What, what's your first memory of football, watching, playing, cast your mind back? I think my, my first memory of football is playing again. I've got an older brother who again started before me, but I think sort of piggybacking off him, I wanted to get involved as soon as he did. I um, wasn't allowed to, but um, we just used to play in the background. I think my first memory of watching games, obviously I, I came through at Sydney United. We used to go and watch those them play on a Sunday whenever they had their matches in the NSL. <laughs> but I remember very, like, sort of vividly, we, I remember the World Cup in uh, Italy in 1990, and I remember watching it on a little TV we had in mum and dad's room. And I was just like, yeah, this is incredible. Yeah. Like, not to ever, you know, I don't even think I had the dream of at that point to go, well, what does this look like for me or anything like that? But I just remember thinking, wow, what a spectacle. Um, and again, I just, I don't know. I just fell in love with the game and just, yeah, wanted to play it at every opportunity I, I got. So who would you, what, what was your first, team you would have played for who would they be in? What, i played for uh warrington croatia was the team then that'd be um, under what under sevens what was the strip strip was a red white and it's blue it's gonna have to be red white and blue yeah, wasn't it? it's red white and blue there was a big croatian emblem in the middle yep. but um first team we had a yeah it was a good season scored a lot of goals and sort of i guess had a, had a knack for it and everyone was excited and super, you know, we, and then later on in the following season, I had my mum as a coach. I had my auntie. Your mum was coach? I had my auntie as like her assistant. And Did your mum used to discipline you when you went to oh, the I don't think she, it's, it's strange, but like you said, they're just the memories you yes. get. And, and that's brilliant. It's mate. part of like, I guess it's, you know, when you sort of say that now and you look back on it, you're thinking, wow. And I, I picture myself, I picture my boys now with, I'm like with my wife as their coach and I'm like, wow, that was, but no one, no one could do it. And so she, so your, your mum's the coach, your wife is now the coach of the boys. No, no. I'm right. just saying, uh, I'm was, just yeah, saying okay. if she was, I'm yeah. like, yeah, I don't think that's, that, that's <laughs> happening. But, um, 
to be honest, it was, uh, again, one of those where you just, you don't know any different no, and no, you just absolutely. crack on with what you're doing. So, uh, and, and were you, uh, uh, I asked this in this part of the podcast, I always ask the same question and I always use the same two gentlemen. Um, I don't know if you know anything about cricket, Millet, but I'll use a, a cricket analogy. Ricky Ponting from age 12 was always going to play for Australia because he was incredibly talented and hard working, but incredibly talented. Justin Langer had to fight his way into every single squad and wasn't the most talented, but ended up having an unbelievable career for Australia. Were you the kid that everyone's like, oh, no, we're playing that melee like this week, or were you just sort of in the pack? No time for modesty. Oh, man, at that young age? I'd probably go somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, if that's a, even an answer. Yep. So but, you're, a, you're a talented footballer. Oh, I guess I yeah, I did at, a, at that young age. It's very difficult to say, but I think as I went through, I don't know how any more talented I was than anyone else, but you know what later on you'll see is yeah, you, you, you're more Justin Langer than anything else. Yep, yep. 100%. Well, and we'll get to your side of that story. What were you going to do if you weren't a professional footballer? I don't know. I was studying actually to, uh, okay. there was a time I was studying to get a, was a building diploma actually at TAFE okay. um, in New South Wales. So there was a, there was a moment there just before I went to Central Coast and I was doing some, it was like a part-time course working for my uncle in the office in the, in town. Um, and that was the first real time I was maybe 20 or something, 21, where I sort of thought, oh, this is, but there was always that, and I and I was fortunate because I had the support of everyone around me. I had the support of my 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 parents, um, you know, my uncle who was who was my employer at the time, um, and they knew ultimately that's what I wanted to do. So you were playing state league. I played in the state league. Yeah, I played in the state league for Sydney United. So, and so at that stage, so just people, so I can be clear and people listening clear, that's at that stage one step below the A-league? That's one step below the A-league, yeah. So um, like, what are you getting paid to, are you just getting a play to play games there? Basically, like yeah. I can't even remember what I was getting paid. Probably but, slightly less because I was a local lad as well. But like a couple of thousand bucks a game or nah. a couple of hundred bucks a game? Oh, right, okay. <laughs> A couple of hundred a game or a couple of hundred a game? Probably. Right. So people listening to this will will understand that, you know, Tottenham's got these unbelievable academies and kids go there from age 12 or I don't know, what time, what age do they start the academies? Five or six. So so you're you're not at the academy at age five or six. So is is football passing you by a little bit? Like, uh, uh, are you going to make it at this point or not? Are you playing state league for a couple of hundred bucks yeah, in your age twenty twenty one? And that came on uh, that came on the back of a, a, a stint in 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 Croatia for a period, which again is. But uh, you went and played in Croatia. Yeah, so I was. Oh, I hardly played, but I lived there for a year, and I I did. I was part of a team. I, I didn't play a lot. But and again, what standard team was that? That was in the top league. Okay, but you didn't get much of a I run. I didn't get much of a run. I had it. You know, it was wasn't easy, but it taught me a lot about myself. What'd you learn? Um, I think just the resilience of, you know, it wasn't easy at times. But again, in saying that, I made the most of the opportunity. I met some really good people um, and had to grow up. It was one of them, like, not that I wasn't mature or, you know, but again, from a footballing perspective when, you know, you're... And I knew how, I know how cutthroat it is. I know how cutthroat the game is. Well, this is the thing. You're, you're traveling to another country to ostensibly take another bloke's job. Yeah. Right? Well, that, no, that, that's the be all and end all. Absolutely. And I understand that. And, you know, you're given an opportunity and, you know, it's up to you how you take that. And ultimately we had a, you know, and again, this you learn this along the way, which you don't necessarily always see in Oz growing up because of the... I guess the restrictions or the circumstances of certain situations, but we had a, I had a manager that signed me and was a big part of me going to the club. And then not too long in, like he had left and it was like, right, we got another guy in who a big name in Croatia, in the history of Croatian uh, football. What's his name? Miroslav Blažević. He took okay. Croatia to the bronze medal in 1998 World Cup. So it was a huge figure and 
I just knew probably I wasn't going to get an opportunity because again, he would have wanted a bit more experience and that's fine. You just go through that. You know, you, you don't know anymore. You, you keep pushing yourself and, but when you look back on it, you go, right, that's why the opportunities maybe were slightly restricted. Maybe. So, so, so when you come home off the back of that, do you think, oh, I'm hanging in here or I haven't got what it takes or I do have what it takes and now I know that I can do this? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't ever think. For me personally, it was never. I don't have what it takes. I never didn't have. I didn't have the self doubt. I don't think that was ever the case. I just think it was basically probably out to just rebuild myself a little bit, and just go get back to enjoying playing my football and getting back to a level where, um, yeah, like I said, the enjoyment. I knew most of the time then it's going to you know hopefully if i get into a good rhythm games and yep. as you do as people talk about that game rhythm and stuff then slowly slowly you chip away at it and then you see where it gets yeah there's no guarantees of anything but again you hold that sort of faith of you've you've had a little taster of it i'd say it's what is it the appetizer i've had i've mm. had the i've had the i've had the hors d'oeuvre the ap appetizer yeah. <laughs> i want the main course i want to go back and and but when i go back this is going to last. Like I ain't going to, I'm not going to relinquish this op and the next opportunity. So you end up at central coast, but you're just, it's not a contractual situation or anything. And th this is the great part of your story. Explain, cause we'll get to where you get to, but explain what, what, what was your situation up at central coast? So again, um, that was that time where, you know, doing the studying and then this opportunity came around. So it was on the back of winning the title with Sydney United in this, in the state league, which again was a massive thing for us doing it with my mates was fantastic. Um, and so how, how, do, how does, um, so Sydney United, that's a Croatian based club. Yep. How, how does a Croatian based club celebrate? Like, is this sort of, was it? Slivovitz or what? what, what like, uh, I don't know if I had many of them, but right. uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, we uh, we do. Yeah, there, there might have been a couple of them. But okay. we were we had a we had a thing at the club. We went back and had a dinner. Then we, all the boys organised to go out in town and okay. something. It, we we enjoyed ourselves absolutely. But on the back of that, then um, I think there was a small window of opportunity with the A League. Like they had a couple of roster spots left in certain clubs, but again, they were getting filled up um, from the previous season, which was the first season, and then. Oh, that got, was the first season. That was the first early. season, the previous one. And then, so this was the second season we were sort of coming into on the back of this state league season. And then uh, I got a, I got in contact with uh, Laurie McKenna, who was at the time Central Coast manager. And I knew Laurie from previously. I'd never worked with him, but I knew of him. And basically he just said, come up here. Like there's no guarantees on anything, come up. And then once I got up there, I did the travel from again. I was working with my uncle for my uncle, so he was very understanding. And so, how far was the trip? Gosford to Western Sydney every every day, sometimes and sometimes every other day. You're not getting paid at all. Nah, nah, not a cracker. Nah, petrol money. No, nah. right. So, so it's costing you to get up there. And yeah, try. but again, I think the way I approached it was. To be honest with Laurie and everyone at Central Coast, they were brilliant because I seen the environment. I was like, oh, I, like, I want me some of this. Like, this would be, this is great. I like, want I, me some I, of this. This would be like this, this I can see helping me, you know, take the next step. And Laurie and, and everyone at the club were very frank with me. They said, oh, at the moment, we don't have a slot, but like, you're more than welcome. So I was like, okay, brilliant. I'm like, I'll, I'll come up when I can. And I'll get around it. And that's what I did. I just chipped away at it and... There was a couple of sort of short-term deals that didn't sort of eventuate. I got sort of signed for four games. I didn't play. And then... At Central Coast? Yeah, where I sort of, like an injury replacement, basically. They had these short-term contracts. But then still didn't get a start. I still didn't get a start. Oh. And then it sort of came to a bit of a crossroads a little bit. And How old are you at this stage when you hit the crossroads? I think it was there 20... Two, maybe 20, yeah, 21, okay. 21, so, maybe. What and, was the crossroads? And then you get like, I was, I was doing this travel and I'm like, I sort of try to put the heat on them a little bit. Like I'm like, I'm, I'm coming up here. Like I might not be able to come up as much. And I, cause I threw it out there with one of the assistants at the time. And I think word got, obviously word got to Laurie as you do as an assistant, knowing that now yeah. like, it, gets, <laughs> it gets to Laurie. And, and to be fair to Laurie, like he was good as gold. I went, I was in. I was in the office in the city, uh, in Pitt Street, and I remember leaving the car park, and he's like, "Where are you?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm down in the office. I'll oh, get back up here. You're starting on the weekend." First game of A League. For, 
first game, like it would, it would have been my first game. It was in the following season, and and oh, in the in the, in that second season, and I'm like, oh, okay. I got off the phone. I'm like, I've got the call that I've wanted. Like, there's no excuse now. Like, go and do what you got to do. And what's your memories of your first start? Oh, it was a tough game. Yeah, we played Newcastle, so it was a derby. Um, Nicky Carl, who then was oh, a, yeah. who was my Socceroos sort of roommate for a little period, and and someone that I know. Uh, was was the key player and again he had a good game they ended up winning but i made an impression um obviously enough on laurie he sort of never sort of wavered in how he thought about me anyway but always grateful for that first opportunity that first game as they say you ended up you know as we talked about the international side of it you mentioned the state you ended up in turkey right now I, I read the name. My Turkish football is not that good. Can you please pronounce the name? Of the Do you t- want to have a go? No. I, well, no, because I ended up just writing Turkey because it was G's and B's and Q's and R's. So the the, the proper way to say it is Genshlebeli. Genshlebeli, yeah. which is where I've spent a bit of time Ankara. in Turkey. Oh, in Ankara. Oh, she. I remember a real cold period. Yeah. It gets cold. Yeah. So I signed in. I signed in the January window, which again is their winter. Oh, so I got there. It was. They still have all this. Like they were, mate. I was there in like ninety five, and they were whatever they were burning to keep warm. There was just this. I love Turkey. There was just this smog across the yeah, whole city. So it was. It was a definitely a, one of those freezing joint. It was cold. We we got we flew out straight away to Antalya, which is on the coast, where, yep. they, where they were doing a mini sort of preseason. So that was my first experience of it you were with your girlfriend Why? yeah she was my fiance fiance but she didn't go over at the start okay um not when i signed and all that i had sort of literally got signed the sign on the dotted line went to antalya done sort of the mini pre-season back to ankara we started the season again and then did you start yeah i played yeah right yeah yeah i played so, straight so, in the team so when you get off a plane right this is again that fascinates me. You get off a plane, you go to a club where I presume your Turkish is not that flash. Yeah, no, I didn't know a word. Okay, so that's not that flash. Yeah. So, got to find somewhere to live, new food, new team, new teammates. Like football's football, but how do you go on the first day? Do you like you go in and shake everyone's hand and introduce yourself, or do you sort of sit in the back row like you don't want to sit in the staff, you know, striker's seat and all that type nah, of stuff? Yeah, you, you, you have to. You have to go and do that you're there to do it you're there to do a job you're there to make an impression first and first and foremost get can they get a glimpse into me a little bit around how i am as a person um never mind the football um they'll they'll get to see that no problem but as a person and i was fortunate enough at that time because i had there was two young australians that were already there at the time bruce jitte and james troisi oh, yep. um so those boys were already there they had six months ahead of me so they sort of caught me up on that. I was obviously a little bit older than them. So again, but they were brilliant. Like I said, having the boys there was great for the settling in period. Then when my wife came over, um, James had his family there. So his parents were there and his younger brother and uh, they sort of helped with her yep. and, and sort of showed her what they do and how they do things. and. Again, for me, I could just focus on what I needed to do, and and ultimately that's what I did. And we had a we had a great time. T- tell me an experience that you had playing Turkish football that would surprise me and people listening here, and where you think, oh yeah, I found myself at this ground, or oh, this happened, or uh, I got one. I got a story. Oh, I got stories. There's stories. We could probably, like you said, we could probably spend <laughs> a couple of hours and go through them all. But I remember one game. So just to put a bit of context yes. onto the onto this story. So when I signed for the team, um, they were they were struck like they were struggling. It was a you know relegation dogfight as they as they call it the terminology. And we were playing uh, so we, we had a good few games at the start. We won a couple of games which was like we had won the World Cup. Um, was it? the celebrations and stuff, which again you were getting your head but then we went <laughs> a few months into it, we went to a, a t- another rival basically that was in that same scrap. So None the wiser. I'm sitting on the team coach. We're we're going to the game, and the I've got the old you know the headphone. Everyone wears the headphones, the noise cancelling ones, and I've got them on listening to a bit of music. And all of a sudden, I see jumping people sort of jumping out the way from this the right hand side over to the left hand of the thing. And I'm like, what's going on? Take the pop the 
i på hans stjerne. Duff, duff, duff. There were there were opposition fans throwing big like boulders at the at the at team the coach. coach just to try and intimidate. See, but mind you, we we went to we had like an escort and stuff. Like we had a, always had a, the security was you know unrivaled. It was we had an escort to go to the games, but you'd see and I caught them. I opened the blind. I opened the curtain. I looked and I'm like kids and they're just running off, like they're just running down the track and and, huh. and so then you you turn up to this game and obviously how hostile you can imagine the hostility and well i can't like what is the host but like all, all i can remember the shot of the unsuccessful unfortunately socceroos getting off the plane and going to the hotel in uruguay, uruguay. i remember seeing that and yeah. thinking so is, is it like yeah that? there's there i mean we yeah you, it's it's like that i guess from that perspective, there's obviously booing and noises and whistling. And again, depending, there's, there's, there's some horror stories from Turkey, not that I ever experienced that, but there are, depending on which teams play each other, like some of that rivalry beforehand yep. can be very, very destructive, not pleasant to be around. But again, that, that was, that was something where you're like, I think we ended up drawing the game, which again was good for us at that time. But, um, yeah, it was one of them where you're thinking, whoa. He's a jumping over. And they're like, oh, there's, you know, rocks and boulders and stuff getting thrown. So you end up at Crystal Palace. This is a good chance to talk about how this type of thing happens. Because, again, Ange explained it to me about how as a as a coach and you have someone looking after you, it, how does it happen with a with – an? is it called an agent? You call them yeah. an agent? Um, and the decision-making process to get offered an opportunity and then as a footballer – do you then have to look at where you're going to fit in that potential team and whether you're going to play? Like, how does all that work? Well, you're in Turkey and then there's an opportunity to go to Crystal Palace. Like, does, does the phone ring and you, how's it work? Yeah, the phone rings. You have a couple of conversations with, I think at the time, um, Tony Popovich was at Crystal, Crystal Palace. Palace. Okay. So as the assistant, he had just got there and we had a conversation. Then we had a conversation with uh, an agent mutual someone that we both know um and then that sort of conversation started to happen first of all would you be interested obviously i knew where they were they were in the championship obviously i got aspirations to keep pushing on and try and get to the highest level so i had teammates in the socceroos and that were playing at the top level and i thought oh yeah i'll just get there you know yeah <laughs> but then you get you know brought back down to earth and you're like, well, this is, you know, there's a, there's a path to this. And, um, then we come over and explore the opportunity. Uh, so we, was that a tour of the club? Yeah. Tour of the club, uh, not the club as such. We met with the manager at the time, Dougie Friedman, who's the sporting director there at the moment. And what type of guarantees or non guarantees do they give? Do they set out? We think, right. Emile, we've got a, a weakness where you play, we can see you playing here or is it just mate, turn up and give it your best shot and we'll see how you go. Yeah, probably more the latter, but not like, not not as not a, not like that. But I think they they obviously do their homework, right? So Tony would have known he knew about me, obviously through yep. the national team and stuff. But they would have then it would have been they would have alerted the manager, and then they would have done their own research on that. Um, and that's how the, I think that's how the conversation was sparked. The the agent at the time mentioned me to them, and he was like, oh, it just sparked something in them, and they go, oh, okay, let's explore this. Um, and so then you sit down and you speak about what the potential plans might be, not necessarily for you as an individual, but the team. Again, ultimately, that's how you pitch it. You're pitching it to the team. I remember it, I was, we were sat in a hotel in London and it was mm. myself, the agent at the time, me and my wife. My wife was pregnant. And uh, Dougie, the manager at the time, goes to, to us. He goes, um, oh, we'll get you into the... We'll get you into this hospital and blah, blah, we'll take care of it all and blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, we end up signing. <laughs> we end up signing the contract and funnily enough, this, this clause is in the contract and you're like, okay. And then we end up having our first son and we, we don't stop hearing about this bloody hospital bill from these, <laughs> <laughs> like afterwards, not afterwards, not, not in the immediate time. Right. But we started, cause again, it, they, they offered it and you're like, well. We so finished. that was part of the contract. 
Well, they they had offered it, right, so you're absolutely. like, well, okay, if that's what you want to do, then they were not, they were like more than happy to offer it, and I'm like, well, okay. What, and the bill got a bit higher than was well, expected. I think, wasn't it? I think for, by their it blew accounts, out a bit. yeah, a little bit. I guess my wife had a cesarean, so again, she had to stay in there and whatnot. Well, the hospital but... probably looked at it right. Crystal Palace was playing the bill. Yeah, it's probably a weekend. So on the grubby topic of money, okay, and well, it's not grubby for you guys because it's all public knowledge. Your your, your salaries are public knowledge. Do, do you go in with a financial hope or request from your agent or h- how does all that work? Like what you're going to get paid or is the club just says, right, mate, this is what you're going to get paid? No, it's a negotiation. Okay, it's it? a negotiation. Yeah, it's a negotiation. Okay. Um, but again, it's always market value. What are the, what is the club paying? What are they are they paying their top earners? What are they paying? What's the bottom? Okay. Where, where do you fit in all of that? And again, not stuff that you particularly get involved in, but the agent sort of relays that message. Sometimes he makes a decision on where he thinks you'll be pitched yep. at. And, and what type of clip does the agent take? Again, they it depends. Sometimes they get, most of the time they'll get, they'll get something from the club that's for arranging the deal and things okay. like that. I so. Know. So, I know that's how it's worked previously. So I haven't looked up um, what you were getting paid at Crystal Palace. Like, at, at when you joined Crystal Palace, what would be... You won't know that, though. Anyway. Well, what would be the top wage generally at Crystal Palace at that stage? I don't know. In the championship, Yeah, I don't... Pff, Rough. Just so give people an idea. It might have been like 15,000, 12,000 pounds a week. A week? It's not bad, is it? Okay, so that's for your top liner. Okay. <coughs> I'd imagine... Something Righto. like that. Righto. What's um like what what's uh, who's getting paid the most at Tottenham now? It's not public. It's not public. Oh, it's not public. It's not public. No, oh, it's not public. It's oh, okay. Oh, right. That's disappointing. Okay. No. Well, I've had a bit more than fifteen thousand pounds a week. Anyway, I used to work in England. I used to work on the F one car racing, yeah. and the boys had an expression: if you got a pay rise, are you on footballers' wages yet? Or right. not? That was the expression: right. footballers' wages. Okay. Crystal Palace. Um. In the Football League Championship, so one below the English Premier League for those that are tuning in. So you became captain, and then you became captain of the Socceroos. You became captain in a lot of places you played. You're going to find this you – know, I'm picking you a pretty modest man. You're going to find this difficult to answer me, but do your best. Why have managers selected you as captain? Um, they obviously – I guess they, they've 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 obviously seen something that they they like. They think they that that's reflective of what their team should be like. Um, they obviously seen someone that was invested in the team, um, and had he, had his own standards. Yep. And knew how to maybe articulate that and communicate that with his peers as well. That's a great answer. On the pitch, um, and through through what through sheer experience through sheer listening i used to love being around different groups and i remember my first times at the socceroos and you know speaking to and seeing some of the observing some of the the guys i looked up to watching um and seeing them and being around them and picking their brains for a bit of knowledge and you know whether that be in a training session or at a meal time and again it's not that you ever you, you didn't sort of mimic or copy that it was more right what's the behavior and then your own interpretation of that yep. right until you go through that um and that's sort of how i guess and then you try and you try and do it through behaviors for me it's always behavior you gotta if you're gonna talk the talk then you need to be able to do what you're saying and i used to that that was my thing it was you know by example and I was fortunate enough to be able to do that for, for for a number of years. From the outside looking in, you always seem to be the ultimate team man. You, you look to be a bloke that would sacrifice what he had to do to help the team in every single. Yeah, moment. it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a fair point. Um, yeah, it's there's no doubt about that. I think <laughs> sometimes at the cost of my own well being in terms of playing and stuff like that, you go through little niggles and. Um, <laughs> yeah, some key matches. I remember that you know you you played with basically one leg and you do it for the team and uh, you you felt it afterwards. But for the sacrifice of what you were going to maybe potentially achieve or what you were going to win, then yeah, it was a small sacrifice. 
I want to ask you about a few different games in your career now, both, okay. both in the UK and then obviously for the Socceroos. Um, firstly, Crystal Palace in the 12-13 season. The most bizarre thing is I, I hadn't gone back to what your early career is. You rolling without a beard just looked. Oh, yeah. Wow. And a, and a big head of hair. A lot of hair. A, a good bouffant, mm. I would describe it. Mm. This is pre-beard. You look yeah. very different pre-beard. Yeah. You look young. So that one of the great things about football is promotion and relegation. And I, I still don't think we understand here what it means. But the final day of the 12-13 season, so you need to secure a playoff place. So one and two go directly up to the EPL. Yeah. Three, four, five, and six go into the playoffs yeah. to get a spot in the EPL. So you need to secure a playoff place in this final game against Peterborough. I watched the highlights. And you scored. Yeah. What is a moment like that like before we get to the actual playoff? I think and I'm pretty happy with my research there too, by the way, Miller. I, I think, think I got that uh, right. No, the research is good. I think I think uh I think like that. I remember the day quite vividly. Didn't start well. We didn't particularly you know, there was a bit of we hadn't had a particularly good run in to the end of the season. We lost that, quite a few games on the trot, I think. We did you? and we were sort of I think the term would be stumbling our way into the thing after a really fantastic, like. So you were dropping down the ladder. We were. We our form wasn't the best. Okay. Um, and we were we were holding on in certain aspects, but we had a few results, and then we came to that last game, and uh, you know we we go down, we come back, we go down again, so we're losing two one, and we score. Kevin Phillips scores a, a great goal, two two. That, that the roof's off, like. A point's enough because the other results are going our way, and, we, yeah. and we're, we're we're secure. We were secure with a point anyway, and then we get a free kick towards the end of the game, and I got my big boof on, as you said, <laughs> on, onto the onto the ball, and yeah, I reckon you just clipped your score, hair, score the goal, and and again. But the strange thing about that game was it was it was a real hard one because we won and we knew where we were going, but they had got relegated that day yeah, as they a got result of back. that goal, and I got one of my who became my teammate was in that team as well at the time. And I just think to myself, wow, like well, obviously we were on a thing, but you, you, you almost felt like, wow, these have just been relegated on the back of this. You, you realize that afterwards and you're like, yeah, really a real surreal moment. But I was just happy that we won and we, we got a little bit of momentum back. So then you go into the playoffs. Um, so you finish fifth, uh, you knock over Brighton and Hal Obion 2-0. On aggregate, um, but then you have to play Crystal Palace versus Watford in front of eighty-two thousand people at Wembley. And the first thing on the highlights of this, I watched fifteen minutes of highlights on YouTube. First thing, I'll make the commentator comes up and says, "So, so for people to understand, they're in Division One, and this is to go into the English Premier League." The first thing he says. Or not Division I don't One. Know what uh, you're going to say? Yeah, so the Championship League. How uh, much the go. game's worth? It's the first thing he says. This game could be worth 120 million pounds to the football club that wins it. And that got my attention, Mille. It's the biggest game in. It's the richest game in football. The richest game in football. Yeah, it's gone up. I think now since then, ten Has years it? inflation and extraordinary. Yeah, extraordinary. It's... So t tell me about the game, which went to extra time before your man Phillips delivered. Yeah, it should have probably been won by us. In normal time, we had a number of opportunities, but again, and obviously, everyone knows what Wembley is, and any football fan knows, you know, all the FA Cup. What is it like on a day it's like that? Unbelievable. Is it? <sighs> what, what? What's unbelievable about it? Sea of red and blue that we had at the time with Palace. Their fans were off the charts. Um, yeah, they were never sort of outsung. From my experiences at Wembley with them, they were never sort of outsung. And what's the what? Are, what are they sing for Palace? Like what type of stuff they go? Oh, with? they just go hard the whole time. Just noise, pure noise, and they have they've, a song for you. They've got. What did they have a song? They had a song for me. Go on. They had a song for me. Come on. How's it go? <laughs> come on. <laughs> You're testing me. No, come here. on. As if you mate. There's blokes singing songs about you. They're must testing know. me. They had the uh, what was it? Who was it? Casey and the Sunshine Band. Right. No, 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 no. And then it was my name, and that's how it was. Mila, yeah, yeah, that, that's how it was, yeah. No. Have I got that? So you could finish it. You could have done it for me. There you go. No, you're better. So that was that was like it. That was that was the one I used to get there, and but again. Yeah, the, the, Wembley, the Wembley, the yep. Wembley, the Wembley game, 
was, yeah. Again, you look at that moment and you think, wow, like I knew what was at stake. I knew what it meant, what it would have meant to everybody. And yeah, I sort of, yeah, that was the sort of overriding emotion was, wow, this is going to be life-changing. This is where I wanted to try and end up is in the Premier League. And I did it with Crystal Palace doing it this way. We've got promoted and being a part of that was yeah, extra special with the sort of group we had at the time and what we had been through. Again, it made it more special. What, what does it mean... What does it mean to the diehard fans? Like you must have had people come up to you. I'm sure you still do now on the streets of London saying, mate, I'm a Crystal Palace man and I, 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 I saw what you did and what it meant to me and my family and the generations of support of this footy club. Like I think you'd been out of the EPL for top five for eight years or something at that point. Yeah, and as a result now, they've not come out. No. And they hadn't survived previously before that, so... I think that sits well with me at the moment. It always has done because we were part of that team that was able to keep them in the Premier League where ultimately we felt we belonged at that time and you know they've gone on and they you know they've gone on and been now stalwarts for for a number of years now I think it's their 11th season yep. this year. So again on the back of that stuff, when you when you were the guys to sort of make that step, because it is hard, it's not straightforward. It wasn't even straightforward that season, but to be able to do that, like you said, you get um, pulled in the street, and people will always say, and again, you just remember it with fondness. It's it's a, you know it's a big smile on the face for sure. Socceroos, yeah, three World Cups, 2010, 2014 as captain, 2018 as captain, um, South Africa. Brazil, um, and then obviously 2018. What is, like, what's a World Cup like as a footballer? Well, this is a football that wasn't getting a start for Central Coast, and then you're rolling out as captain. Is it as much as we see, you know? It's, uh, what is it? It's, for me, at the World Cups were, yeah, they were dreams come true from a, you know, you talk about that playoff game and what that meant. From a national team perspective, watching the national team not qualify for a number of years. Yeah, heartbreaking. Being around and in sort of, you know, on the, and seeing, seeing that firsthand, what it meant, and then seeing the boys qualify in 2005 and what it meant again to, the, to us as football fans. Then the boys go and produce what they did in Germany, which was, again, outstanding. The support, the level got to get part of this like this is this is thing and so i remember on the back of the you know going into the 2010 again someone who was on the periphery i'd say as a squad member and um you know a squad of 30 gets picked and then it gets trimmed down to 23 and when you sort of realize how is that when like is that pim at that stage yeah it was yeah does he come does he tell you individually before or is it a team announcement um, I think the guys, it's usually, it usually tends to be the guys that miss out, get told individually, which is quite full on. Oh, um, I only know that cause I've had those conversations with my teammates previously in the, in the other, in the world cups after that, yep. being the captain, uh, cause I thought that's the right thing to do. What do you say? That's a really good topic. So, so um, you... you've, they've obviously been informed. So they've had a conversation with the manager and they've been with you this whole journey, right? And all the that, qualifiers, all the... and Yeah, and some of that would be, some of them would have been around it. So for me, the biggest thing I can do, and, and it's not easy, they're not easy conversations, but you have to show gratitude and you have to show an appreciation for that person because regardless of what their match minutes, they've been part of something that's ultimately got us to this point now. And their contribution has been significant and not, and I won't have anyone say to me that it hasn't been, hmm. whether they're the first camp or the last camp, that's hundred camps or, or one camp. Like you've, you've, you, you've got to this point, which is amazing, unfortunately, but we need to go and represent you and you're just as a part of this as anyone. And a lot of the times, like if it was someone younger or like your time will come, Keep at it. Keep persistent. You have to give that. You have to give them that that hope. So the World Cups themselves, um, from the three that you played in, the one that stands out is the Dutch game and Timmy Kale's goal. Um, but you've scored numerous times 
in World Cups. I think like th- have he scored three? I oh, scored three, three penalties, three penalties. At, at the two different World Cups. Yeah. Okay. So this because uh, when I read about you, it's like this man doesn't miss penalties. So that's why they keep putting you up. So you're obviously very good at that. Tell me about the pressure of going to the penalty spot in a World Cup match and how you would work your way through it, Mule. Well, the 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 Dutch game that you're mentioning mm. there, the Holland one, was, again, my first experience of having to do that for the national team in the World Cup, right? So you don't know how you're going to respond would be my honesty, but... We had like we had a solid game up until that point. We were Cracking so game. you were feeling. Well, we were feeling like I was feeling obviously feeling confident. And I, the honesty is, I don't didn't really think about where I was in that moment um, because again, my sole focus was what I had to do. Do my you have job. Do you have a process? To, yeah, I think. What's your process? When you like, I think when you step away from it and you look at it, it's like, well, I know what I want to do. I've got to go and grab the ball and, and spot the ball. No problem. I'm going to focus on what, I, what I've got to do, go through the sort of routine. Um, not that it's anything, you know, out of this world, but again, for me, it was very much right. Pick your spot, clean contact. If he goes the right way, make sure it's hard enough that he doesn't think. Now, that always doesn't come to fruition, but I just thought I'm going to go here. And for that one particularly, I went, I went like I, I, my mind was made up before I'd even shot. So I went. The ones after that, though, that wasn't the case because, again, I'm – Four years down the line, goalkeepers have probably seen me take all sorts of penalties. So they know a little bit more yep. about me as well. So again, you 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 play that, you know, you go through that again. You go through a similar routine, and then I guess with me, it's it was particularly for those two, the last two, running up to the ball. And I wouldn't say the first, well, even the first one against France, but. The Denmark one definitely like he goes slightly early, and then you 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 can see him in your periphery, <laughs> so you just play it to the side of him, and that's not typically the way I wanted to shoot. I like to always go across myself to the left. Yes, um, but he left it open, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll take the opportunity then. And what is it like scoring in a World Cup? Oh, it's amazing. Is it? It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I think for me, uh, again. <laughs> I hate saying it, but no, no, I hate saying it. I don't hate saying it because it's, it is what it is. I had people there in the stadium for me, my family. I lived their dreams through, through what I just did. And they, you know, they were there to support me, but you're given back to them in those moments. But then what you then realize is you've also given back to all the other Australians that are watching there. And then you start seeing the viral videos of people in, wherever they're watching the games afterwards. Cause my sister would like send them through or people would send them through to me. And I'm like, wow, like this is incredible. I'd love to keep scoring. <laughs> so, so I've got 10 minutes left and then you got to go. Um, 2015 Asian cup, um, South Korea who'd beaten you in the, uh, pool matches. Uh, Luongo scores 45, then Sun scores in injury time. And then Tommy Urich. The ball's dead. Like, the ball looks dead. And to me, that is an Australian football side. Never giving up. And he just battled. He was on his bum. And it was like the Korean bloke gave up thinking, well, you know, it's going to go out of bounds here um, across the goal line. What's your memories of, of that, the ensuing goal, and being the first Australian captain to hold up a major trophy in football? That's a rather big question. Isn't I remember. It? No, it's good. It's a good question. Um, I think from my perspective, there it was. You know, we play. Obviously, we played him in the group. I didn't play in that game. I got injured in the tournament. Yeah, that's why we didn't early. win, mate. I wrote that down. No Mille, no soccer. And, then, and so then you go through that. The, the final comes around, and then you know you've got to deal with that bit of a setback when Sonny scores in the last minute. Oh. They they've got all the energy, and and to be fair to Korea that day, they were they were outstanding on the day. Um, and again, we get back to that. And then I remember it, you know, it would be documented, the, the, the half time, the sort of extra time, the end of full time huddle and the boss is speaking. Ange. And he's speaking about. What's he saying? He's going, it's only going to make this story even better. Like, forget <laughs> it. Like, you know, a typical <laughs> thing as he was, you know, as he is, he, you know, he's gives you that extra, extra bit of, right. We're, we're good here. We're fine. Like there's nothing, you know, when, the whole stadium was nervous 
as you as as you know, you can sense that. You can get that sense. I remember but throwing stuff at the telly when they score in. That's what I time. mean. You you would do right. You probably would have. You could have done more than that. You could have ripped your TV yeah. off the wall. But um, we just had this calmness. It, believe it or not, we had this calmness, and we to that moment, and we score. And I was like, I was on my last legs. I had that ankle injury hadn't healed up and I was like I remember going up for a ball and I felt like oh my god I'm, I'm on my leg here but I just remember the full time whistle going I'm, I was just like relieved I was just like wow we've done it we've done it we've done it and on top of that like what my motivation was at the time obviously the team and everything and, and wanting to do it but I had bloody 80 people in the stands for me and I'm yeah. like, they're not going home disappointed here tonight <laughs> like out of we've this is we this moment's not come this night and then we're gonna go home disappointed. We need a like this needs to be a celebration for everyone and yeah, we done it and it was it was incredible. I mean it was it was it was amazing to be to be able to do that and to experience I guess it's always with those things. The tournament itself was fantastic and, and that two weeks, but there'd been a build up of that since even that World Cup in, in Brazil. Like it was just that period to get to that point. And then, like I said, we took care of the business then, and then we just we we sort of kept sort of progressing as a team. Quick answers, first thing that pops in your head. I'm going to ask you a series of quick questions. Oof. Okay, Milad Yednak. Nicknames. Nicknames. Um, he what did he say yesterday? Jedi. But yeah, Jedi. I like I, Jedi. Yeah, I, I did get that every now and then, but I don't particularly have one. Oh, I, the, the boys at Palace used to call me. Um, they used to call me the Gator. The gator, alligator, basically for snapping people. <laughs> okay, gator, snapping at people. All right, what's your favourite food? Um, what was my favourite food? I can't go past some spare ribs. Spare ribs. People come into your house and you have to impress them with your cooking. What are you making? Spit roast. Spit roast. Nice. That's real Croatian heritage. That's fantastic. That's my like roots, yeah. A pig on a spit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Three people are coming to this pig on a spit now. Alive, dead, you've met, you haven't any time from history. Who are the three that are coming? I'm putting you on the spot here. Ooh. I'll go two that I'd like to. I'll go two, two, yep. two in my family that have passed. So okay. I'll go by my grandparents, both of two of my grandparents. I'll go with them. Yep. I'd like to do that. And then... The third one. Who's the third one? Mm, that's a tough one. You are putting me on the spot. We can skip this one. Yeah. But I don't want to because your grandparents are coming, so I want someone else so I can keep your grandparents in. Yeah, I'm just trying to think who's someone that would... Supposed to be quick fire. I'm trying. Then we'll skip it. We'll, we'll come back to that. Come one. back we'll to skip that, that one. one. Um, what was your first ever job? First thing you did for money. First thing I did for money would be, I guess it was working with like within the sort of my. I did some stuff with my uncle who was a, who does concrete pools. Right, you were pouring steel, concrete pools. The steel fixing. He does the steel okay. fixing. So. Quite a he 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 paid me. It wasn't like official, but he 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 gave me some money for that, some pocket money for that. Okay. So, so that was your first job. What was your first ever car? First ever car was a Commodore, Holden Commodore. <laughs> what color? Blue one. I can see you in a yeah, Commodore. Holden Commodore. Yeah. <laughs> what are you currently watching when you get back on the flight back to the UK? What will you be watching? I don't know. What I've watched recently. Yes. I think what I watched recently. I watched the. I don't typically do films. I just don't have the time. Um, what did I watch on the plane? I watched I watched the Hunger Games one, the recent oh, yeah. one. Yeah. Um, I watched I watched the first June movie. Oh yeah. Because I watched the second one, so that they're the two that I watched recently. Favorite movie of all time? I'll go Gladiator. Gladiator, Russell Crowe, hard to beat, hard to beat. Do you read books? I do. Give me a book to read, or that you've read that you've enjoyed. 
And for those listening, I'm reading one at the moment called The Locust. It is outstanding. Oh, one that I've got now. Let me try and think. Let me. I can't. Oh, you got your Apple books there? No, I've got a. Um... You got a list? No, I've. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think of the one that I'm. It was one I read a little while back, but I'll have to get back. I'll have to get okay. back to you on get that one. Get back to me on that one. I have to text get back it through, to you on that and one. we'll I'll put text, it in I'll at this point. The, I'll text through to you. Do you listen to podcasts? I do, every now and then. Okay, give me a podcast that you like. I listen to one that a colleague of mine that I used to work with uh, did called Lobster Brain. Lobster Brain. Yeah. What's the What's the Lobster Brain about? Briefly. So. They call it the, the top lobster. So lobsters, what? how do they describe it? So lobsters, there's obviously a hierarchy in the lobsters, but then they can retrain themselves to get to that top okay. top point again. Lobster so brain. it's people from different backgrounds going through different things and they, they chat about their stories, okay. sports people, people in business and stuff. It's, right uh, it's, an, in, it's an intriguing listen. What do you listen to musically? Um, what do I listen to musically? I think the last, what was the last, more so the last concert yeah, the last I went concert. to. What's the last concert you Post been to? Malone. Post Malone. With my wife, yeah. Was he good? He's a dude with the tattoos yeah, all over his face. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was yeah. in Birmingham. We, uh, okay. we, we had a, we had a good time. Um, favorite holiday destination? Ibiza. Ibiza. Bucket list destination, want to go, haven't been? I don't know. I'm not. I don't know anywhere. Anywhere good with my family would be. Would be. I don't have a particular. I don't think I've got a particular place. Best sporting event you've been to that wasn't involving football. Um, oh, we were rugby world cup. Did you? Yeah, Twickenham, Australia versus Argentina semi final. Did we win or we get beat? We won. Okay. We lost to New Zealand in the final. Bloody Kiwis. Couple more for you and then we've got to get out of your hair. Best piece of advice you've been given in your career, Milo? That's a good one. Mm. Don't know whether it be anything from then or more recent. I think... It's an it's an old one, but again, it'll be something on the lines of like, you know, give it, give every, give it everything, give it everything, make the most of it, and give it everything, give it your best op, give it your best chance. What if anything scares you? Um, I don't know that one. That's something that I haven't really thought about. Maybe that's a good sign. We'll skip that one then. Yeah. I've got two more questions for you, but this is the most important one I have for you. Right. Okay. This defines you as the Socceroos captain, as uh, up and coming manager, as a father of four, as a husband, as a proud Australian, as a Tottenham man, but you need to look me in the eye as uncomfortable as that is when you answer this one. Yep. Milay Yednak, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. Oh, tell me we've got a problem. <laughs> No, I'll give you a second chance. I've had it. I've had it before, though. I I wouldn't. I wouldn't be. I'll. I can go further. I can re. I can. I've eaten it. I've eaten Hawaiian. I know all of that. Like I, I wouldn't not eat it, yep. but it wouldn't be a preference. Peanut butter, crunchy or smooth? <sighs> I'd mix and match both of them. Oh, you might be batting zero for two. They can only be crunchy. We always finish this the same way. Um, and you're a father, so you'll understand the weight of this question. Millay, you've been brilliant with your time. Can't wait to see you out here for Global Football Week with Tottenham. Again, you can see all the details and the links, how you get tickets, how you can see Tottenham in action, Newcastle United, Arsenal as well, the women's squad, Matildas will be playing throughout it. For all those kids that listen to this show, and we're lucky we have a lot, on the way to football practice or guitar practice or math study, or whatever they want to do with their lives, you've had a lot of success. What advice would you give to those youngsters out there that hope to achieve success in their field? Keep dreaming big. Um, and don't let anyone ever tell you not to. Because, Love. yeah, I've <laughs> I've lived it to a certain degree. Um, and you can achieve anything if you put your mind to it. 
Love it, mate. You've come in here off not much sleep. Um, good luck with Tottenham and everything moving forward. Um, I've got something, a little gift for you oh, before you what do wrap you got? it up. What do you got for me? Just a little one to welcome you into... Uh... Oh, look at that. A Tottenham shirt with Howie on it. There that is elite. I want to give you a hug and maybe a kiss after that. That is outstanding. Thank you so much. Not a problem. I'm going to, I'm going to put it on right now. There you go. I'm going to whack that bad boy on. Where do you think I'd play in the current Tottenham team? Like speedy winger or I reckon you'd be yeah suited on the wing. You might even be a you might even be an in inverted fullback potentially. No, 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 no. I'm not playing down back. You boys down yeah, back uh, don't make yeah, a big buck, so I'm a forward. <laughs> our inverted fullbacks are our best attackers okay, at that time. Okay. Oh mate, that is brilliant. I can't thank you guys enough. Thanks to everyone at Tottenham. Mate, thanks for coming on. It's a treat to have a chat with you. I can remember a lot of those games. I remember that um, Asian Cup final and you holding up that trophy it still sits with me so mate uh, good luck travel safe enjoy your time with your family back up in sydney and we'll see you out here in melbourne soon beautiful thank you very much well done